this. <clears throat> and now, Sanvif, over to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that and uh, welcome everybody, everybody once again. Uh, we're gonna do some baton passing of our own and by we I mean uh, my, my co-presenter today and uh, that is uh, Lisa Mabley. Uh, but let me get my uh, present, my share my screen first so that you guys can uh, get our presentation for today. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, give me a quick visual thumbs up if you can see uh, the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Fantastic. Okay, so um, we sort of casually named this talk Agile from the Center. And this, the center was, uh, was that particular title was deliberately, deliberately chosen. Right? And the, it's deliberately chosen as in um, Agile is all, all across the map. They, we have everything from a number of different team-based methods to a, a number of different scaling methods and different uh, passions and different ideas and such. But ultimately, if we bring it back to the center and say, what is, what is the core of Agile? And how do you take that core of Agile and apply it to the folks who are in the center of their organizations? Right? And so but there's a bit, of a bit of a double entendre over there. What some of his agile from the center of agile, and some of those, uh, some of it, what we want to talk about today is the agile from the center of the organizations, and that for us, to a certain extent, means middle management. So you see here uh, are two names and emails. If you need contact contact information, and we'll make these slides available to you in the future, so that you'll have them as an easy reference. Um, you'll have both Lisa's and my uh, email address. But let me uh, just mention a little bit about our company. Some of you might have heard of us. I, I noticed some old friends over here, including my uh, old friend and contact, Cesar, who is a fellow co-founder of the national uh, or the international Agile Leadership uh, Network. I think it was way back in 2004. So it goes, goes back quite a bit. Now, our company, Lightspeed, um, it, it goes back uh, also quite a bit. We were founded in 2007. And uh, one of the things that we've done, I believe, um, fairly well over the years is to focus on the needs of our, in, you know, our customers. And uh, we tend to you know, talk like this, we tend to present, talk, publish and such. But one of the things that we uh, get recognized um, quite often for is the work that we do with our customers. And so we've got a couple of awards. One is the most innovating, innovative agile consulting company in the USA. Uh, last year and this year we had actually another one around leadership development. Um, um, Lisa, I'm going to hand over to you because uh, other than saying that I'm the founder of Lightspeed and have been around for a long time in dog years and uh, human years, uh, I don't want to say much more about myself. So Lisa, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about, about yourself and then as you're doing that, I might actually uh, pop in here into the controls and make you the co-host because right after that we want you we want you to run your Mentimeter quiz, right? Okay, sounds good. Um, good evening, everybody. I am Lisa Mabley. Um, yeah, I am also old in both dog years and human years, so um, <laughs> I've been uh, doing the agile thing here for a little while since about 2012. Started out in the uh, project uh, product management um, area moved into Scrum Mastering, Technical Program Management, and now I am an Agile consultant and coach. Um, about me personally, I, I love to travel. I love being a road warrior. It's a, um, uh, so <laughs> life has changed uh, dramatically for me in the past six weeks or so, but um, I, uh, I, I love coaching, I love consulting, I love helping people out and um, making their lives and their, their workplaces better. So um, we are going to uh, in, in, uh, use a tool called Mentimeter to get a sense of what um, you guys do and your role in your organization. So I'm going to share a link here in the chat. Um, I'm also going to share my screen if you prefer to do that. There is a link in the chat. Um, and, and essentially what we're going to do is create a word cloud here to get a sense of um, where you are in your organization. So I think you've got uh, three words that you can kind of describe that. So if you're in product, be sure product is one of those words. Um, if you're on engineering, have engineering be one of the words. If you're a middle manager, have that be in there. If you're an executive, if you're an individual contributor, 
um, just, uh, you know, we're, we're going to create a little word cloud here just to get a feel of, of who's in the audience. And can I can share now? Yep, you can. <clears throat> Let's see. So we'll uh, let that go for a couple of minutes here. Got about five people who have uh, done it. I think we have about 20 people on the call, so we'll give it a second to, uh, to load up here. About halfway there. Excellent. All right, that's uh, the only one that's left is probably me. So, oops, wait, maybe not. <laughs> I was looking at the counts at the bottom, but. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. We'll give it about uh, another, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds or so. Excellent. Okay. Um, Sanjeev. Fantastic. So I'm going to pass. Um... I will stop sharing and pass it over to you. Has everybody uh, had a chance to look at this and see who we are as a group? All right. Excellent. So we got we have a, a fairly informal agenda. I want to talk about some challenges, uh, specifically about uh, challenges facing folks in middle management. I saw some titles around portfolio managers, uh, program managers, um, yeah, and then of course agile coaches, scrum masters, servant leader, and such. Um, but uh, I'll, you know what we want to do is to you know there is a uh, the title of your group is Demystifying uh, Agile. Right? And I also want to do a little bit of de-vilifying middle management, because I think middle management gets a really bad rap. So we want to do a little bit of a de-vilifying, uh, you know, let's uh, make sure that we appreciate the work that middle manager, management uh, and middle managers do in our organizations, especially with Agile, those, the, those of them who get it. And then we also want to talk about how to work with them. How do we change our system? How do we drive flow innovation and value with this thing that we call the Agile Value Management Office? And um, even though it says there's Q&A at the end, I would encourage you to uh, you know, jump on. You know, like I said, we want to keep this fairly informal. Jump on, just ask a question. And then either Lisa or myself would either answer it, or if you don't know the answer, we'd say we don't know. Or we might defer it and say, hey, can we answer it later on? Um, give me a thumbs up if that informal system works for you. At least when I was there in person, you guys were pretty relaxed. So hopefully that relaxed demeanor has carried over uh, into the virtual world. Okay. Uh, and by the way, you can do both the physical thumbs up or you can do, uh, there's a reaction. There we go. So M MW is giving me a, a virtual thumbs up. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, you know, one of the things that we see is that Folks in the middle, middle management. So we're talking about you know, project managers, program managers, even some senior leads, directors, and even up to VP type level folks. Right? These are folks who are not exactly considered executives and they're not exactly you know, very, that deeply connected to teams. And they get ca caught in many different directions or they get caught from, uh, in, by impacts from many different directions, whether it's top down impacts or executives where you see lack of sponsorship and unclear vision, lack of, you know, or changing priorities, a lack of decision-making authority. Um, and usually they become the sort of, uh, you know, the folks who have the target on the back, on their backs and they're like, oh, you know, middle managers don't get it, they're clueless, they don't know agile, you know, fired a whole lot of them. Uh, one of our friends uh, from a large um, financial services com company here in the DC metro area was saying um, that, their project managers have gotten a really bad rap under Agile Methods. And, and he said, 
literally as we transition to agile, which is an enterprise-based kind of enterprise level transformation, he said project managers, quote unquote, were running for their lives. And the, the organization had just essentially thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And, and he said it was a huge mistake. He was the center of the Agile Center of Excellence. And he said it's a huge mistake because he really felt that certainly there was a percentage of them that didn't get it and they wouldn't make the transition over to Agile Methods. But there's another percentage of them that had hugely valuable skills and had the institutional knowledge and the relationship with their teams and they knew how to get work done. And uh, despite the fact that if you look at the center of the slide that where we see that some of them might have been too comfortable with the status quo or they couldn't influence, I think they, you know, what they wanted to do is to really tap into this, um, this group of people that team members tend to love to hate and then executive managers like to, like to be, or executives and leaders like to jump on, right? And it turns out that long-term ch change efforts, and I think we might even have had this in the session description, long-term change efforts, the most successful of them, 80% of them succeeded because they were driven by middle management. Right? So when middle management drives change management efforts, and many of us profess to be change, change agents, right? 80% of the change efforts that are driven by middle management succeed. And I don't know, that means you know, what happens if we don't get their support, it's gonna be really hard for us to figure out how to succeed in a large, in a, in, especially in a large organization, but even in any sort of organization in a transformation to agile, right? And I think it comes down to Conway's law or Conway's rule. So I'm, I actually wanna throw that back over here. I know we, we have many super experienced agilists over here. So who can tell us what is Conway's law or Conway's rule? As well, it's up there on the right, but without looking at the, without the cheat, <laughs> cheat uh, the cheat sheet. Can, can you explain this in in ter in layman's terms? What is Conway's rule? Conway. The DevOps folks know this because it, it's in every DevOps book that I know. Conway's rule, Conway's law. Uh, architecture and organization match. Architects and organization match. Yeah, absolutely. Or project managers, or business analysts, or any role. So it turns out, and uh, Mitch Conway predicted this or uh, put this, professed this of several decades ago, he said, the organizational structures and our processes mirror each other. Okay. So if we have a process that is waterfall and silo, you know, uh, sequential and big batch, our organizations naturally manifest the type of shape that you see on the screen. These siloed organizations match a sequential batch type process. And when we move to agile methods, we have all this wonderful stuff. Like let's get a team together and let's have them work together and they're gonna be awesome and the teams are awesome and we love them and we're all agilists and uh, life's going to be great. Except we forget the teams have to live within the larger framework or the larger fabric of an organization. So even if you see uh, on this slide, if you look at the bottom left, if we have our wonderful Agile team and our Scrum team that might be somewhere between you know, seven to nine people or so, and they might be fully you know, cross-functional and our folks are T-shaped and they do all this wonderful stuff. Well, we're still looking at a legacy organization that might look uh, something like this, where you might still have a silo for task or a silo for operations, and we don't even know where our business uh, friends are, right? So, if your organization looks like this or some variant of this, give me a thumbs, actually, I don't know if there's a thumbs down, but give me a thumbs up and tell me how many of you are facing an organization where your teams might be agile, but the larger organization is still kind of a silo. So we see Rob and some others, uh, Lisa. So this is the challenge that we have, right? And so what we need to do is to figure out how to drive value across those silos that we have in the absence of somebody just coming and blowing it all apart and putting it together, right? So now you guys are in the Bay Area. If you work at Google or Facebook or Salesforce, your teams are not set up, right? They're entrepreneur, entrepreneurial. They're set up to be agile people to get there. They're set up to, the entire organization is agile. Amazon is an example. But for many others who don't have that ability, if you're not in a product-centric organization, if you work for financial services or medical or government or any other large organization would likely to be living in, in a reality like this, right? It's just a function of 
uh, a legacy organization. And the bottom line is that even with mature agile teams, we might have the most fantastic agile teams with some of the world's greatest agilists. Many of them are, are I'm sure, here with us today on this call. I know it for sure, for sure, right? Even if you have that wonderful situation, we have a water scrum fall type organization, right? So waterfall requirements, great development cycles, you know, awesome sprints and regulations, and then the handoff to uh, the water scrum fall, the handoff to production is still an impediment. Okay? And you can see some of these uh, some of these issues up there. So. If we are to change this, one of the things we have to do is to start to look at how to take that siloed organization and from a hierarchical silo organization and start to turn it and slowly evolve it into more of a network organization, right? So I'm gonna play a short video over here. This guy, I think he's from Deloitte, and he talks about um, building a network of teams. So I gotta stop that share, put the video on the share. So give me a second. Uh, let me get this here, share the screen. All right. And I wanna make sure I can share the computer sets, uh, the sound. So give me a thumbs up if you can see a, a guy with a kind of scraggly beard and uh, okay, fantastic. Uh, let's, uh, if the sound, you might want to turn, sometimes the sound comes really loud when I play this. I'm going to turn it down so it might blare. So here we go. I'm Tom Merritt for Tech Republic. Here are five things to know about a network of teams. You may have heard the phrase network of teams kicking around. It's often described as a non-hierarchical way of organizing your workforce. So how would you build this and what good would it do you? Here are five things to know about a network of teams. Number one, you'll need a map. Take all your current practices, include every employee, and map out how everything you do gets done. This will start to indicate what kinds of teams you will need to cover the things you need to get done. You might even try a technique called Organizational Network Analysis, or ONA, to identify what networks are in place already. Coming in at number two, give the teams their purpose. Once you've identified where you need teams, then you should write up a description of what tasks you want a particular team to execute and what skills are needed from the team members to do that. Each team should know what the organization's goal is and what their goal is as a part of that. Up to number three, decentralize the decision making. Let teams lay out their own roadmap to success. Remember, you gave them the tasks, let the team decide how to accomplish them. Sliding in at number four, provide the infrastructure. Each team's members are responsible for budgeting, hiring, and communicating with other teams, so make sure to give them the tech tools they need to do that efficiently, and provide the transparency and visibility to help them get the information they need. At number five, try, learn, and try again. Let the team make mistakes and let the teams figure out how to correct them. And don't be afraid to disband a team and create new ones as your needs change. Teams are a natural way for people to work. If you set up the system to make it clear where to aim and give them the resources to do it, you may all get better at hitting the target. Hey, there's more where that came from too. Check out our other videos and articles at techrepublic.com. I'll see you there. All right. So we had some ideas about you know how to create those, that network of teams and how to work on uh, you know providing teams with a particular structure and change the system so that the teams can be empowered and aligned and moving together and get working towards a common purpose. So here are some ideas and uh, to actually put that into practice. And the idea is around this concept that we call an agile value management office. So you can see over here uh, that our goal is to create this, what we call a seamless network of organization, encourage face-to-face -face dialogue across levels, because otherwise we have the hierarchical levels not talking to each other and strategy gets stuck at the executive level and we don't have execution. Um, and then also make sure that this particular group, this agile VMO, this mid-level um, group, if you will, is run as a, uh, is run as a team of teams. Right, it's run as a, uh, a team itself. Right? So 
the first thing that we have to do is we have to get executive sanction. Right? So the most su successful transformation always have to have executive support. We can, we can certainly get a bunch of teams together and the teams can be successful. But when you get our executives and the alliance, even if all they have to do is to say, we're going to empower the folks below us, the people who report to us, maybe a VP level folks or the directors or these mid-level managers that we talked about, our executive action teams get, you know, creates that strategy, creates that purpose and sets the direction for the teams, all right? So we get a couple of executives and now here's the thing, we don't leave them at that level. We actually have them be what we call a linking pin or a person who is regularly participating as part of this agile DMO. So the next thing we have to do is to make sure that it's not just stuck at the upper echelons or the upper levels of the management layer. We need to get people from the teams themselves. So whether it's a scrum master or a product owner or rotating responsibility, uh, team members might appoint, uh, uh, elect or select or appoint members to be part of this you know, cross-functional end-to-end agile, agile DMO group. So it's not just executives, it's not just our middle management, but it's also team members who are now going to come together and be part of this, uh, this agile DMO, right? And in doing so, what we want to do is to start to take those silos that we talked about from Conway's rule and start to work now horizontally again across those silos, you know, end to end. Now, some of you might have, you know, well, many of you have probably heard of the scaled agile framework and one of the, uh, you know, safe or scrum, of, scrum, scrum at scale or uh, large scale scrum. And they all have some form of organiza larger organization beyond the team that they might call a value stream. And, and so to get us incrementally towards that value stream, the first thing we have to do is to get the team itself. Our team, just like you saw, might be just in IT. So let's bring in our business partners. Let's bring in our uh, managers. And now what we want to do is to get those teams moving end to end. All right. Uh, here's a case study from Capital One. I think Capital One, they, they have an office right there, downtown San Francisco. Anyone here from Capital One? Uh, you're from Capital One, Elena? All right. And uh, Jean Carlos, fantastic. No, not me. Oh, okay, uh, but we have folks from Capital One. So, yeah. so Capital One is both in you know the East Coast, uh, sort of headquartered in Tyson's Corner here in Virginia, DC Metro. They got a huge um, uh, office and uh, set up in Richmond, Virginia, which is about a hundred miles south from here. And then they have all a lot of stuff right there in the Bay Area, right? Um, one of the things they have is this thing called a command center, and it's 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 uh, Capital One itself is you know, the organization has gone through three major transformations, so they're pretty much agile across the board. Of course, different levels of maturity, but um, one of our, our friends, a gentleman by the name of Mike Garcia, he runs something called the Site Stability. I'm sorry, Stability and Site Reliability Engineering Group. And these are the folks who are looking end to end for intrusions and network security and information security. And when Mike took this over, uh, what he started to do is and he said, well, you know, this is very complex. You've got infrastructure folks, you've got security folks, you've got developers, you've got other business customers. And I just need to pull together, not just those teams working together, but I, I need a management team. I need this group of people that will work cross-functionally, even though they're within the organization. And what he did, he just stripped it down to the basic. So this is agile from the center, both from the center of the organization, but also at coming back to some first principles of agile. So he, he's, he is a management system that he set up for this group. It's actually a, a, had a lot of lean. So you see things like E3 problem solving, right? So E3 is this uh, name in the practice or technique from lean thinking, where you use uh, the name of the paper, the size of the paper, and you get all of your everything that you need to solve your problem on a, a A3 a sheet of paper that's the size of and basically a standard A3 size. Um, uh, combine it with uh, management thinking with objectives and key results. You guys know that. That came from Andy Grove over at uh, Intel Corporation. It was a bit all the rage in Silicon Valley with John Durr. So management thinking with the OKRs. Uh, monthly strategy sessions. And then an agile technique where he's got a, something that he calls a silent stand-up, which I, don't, I won't bore you with. And then team level visualizations. Remember we talked about the network mapping that uh, this gentleman in the, in the video just said, he said, start to think, look at, map out your network, see where the connections are. And this is what Mike Garcia did at Capital One. And what he did was he created this very, you know, simple, lightweight, lean, agile management practice. 
and implemented this agile DNO. And in you know, in one fell swoop, he got this group of people just all, all operating in alignment across many, many different teams. So this is an example from Capital One that I wanted to share with you. And uh, with that, I wanted to kind of stop here and see if you had any questions. Question from the group. We've got one section over here. We're going to jump jump into the application for the Agile DMO. But I've talked about the structure of the Agile DMO. I've talked about how we want to connect them as a network of teams. I've given you a case study from Capital One. And uh, see if you have any questions. Everyone's on mute. So you, if, you, if you want to ask a question, don't forget to take yourself off of mute. How so many ask a fake question? How many teams like how big of a team of team can you can you assemble in a VMO before that starts to get clunky? Like how so many great offices yeah. do you want to have in parallel if you really need to scale to like hundreds or thousands of people? Oh, that's a great question. Of course, uh, you must be an architect or an engineer of all. Are you an architect or an engineer? I'm a user interface designer by trade. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, an I work in organizational design, so that the design part interests me. <laughs> so who knows what a fractal is? What's a fractal? A repeating pattern that uh, at any at any level of sort of how no matter how closely you zoom in, yeah. the fundamental shape is still the same. So and there's your answer. And it has an what, infinite edge. That's right. So what we do, if you want to scale our Agile VMO, you set it up, this, it's a repeating pattern. So this can probably handle about somewhere five to 10 teams. At least I will talk, might be able to talk about our current client. And I forget how many people they have. Like they, they have about, what have we seen? About 25 teams or so uh, between all, all of the Agile VMO, different groups, portfolio, maybe even up a little higher than that. But at some point, what you do, and it also depends on the portfolio, right? So pretty much one or two uh, VMOs per portfolio. And then what you do is you start to set up the same, same pattern um, as a fractal type pattern of, you know, to, to handle um, uh, and scale. And you can do that as you go scale horizontally across multiple teams, but also as you scale vertically uh, as you go higher in the organization. So fractal VMO. Little, uh, little uh, complex answer, but if you guys look it up, it'll, be, it, it, it'll make a lot of sense, <laughs> right? Okay, um, so next thing we have to talk about is how do we drive flow? Right? So when we talk about flow, we're talking about the flow of value, the flow of value from end to end. Remember, in our uh, siloed organization, when we typically uh, in a large organization, what we're going to find is that to deliver value end to end from an end customer's request to traversing from silo to silo to silo back to and then back to the customer, we can end up going across any uh, anywhere between nine to twelve silos. So think about this: somebody wants to request the end user in the, in the customer they have a need, and we're like, oh yes, make it happen. Number one, since we talked about the Star Trek. So let's make it happen. Well, to make it happen in an organization, in that silo organization, you might have to cut across nine to 12 type of uh, you know, uh, t t uh, silos. Over. So uh, when what starts to happen is that when we have an organization that impedes the flow of value, we end up with a really large batch or really large batch of work, whether it's programs or programs aggregated into portfolios or projects aggregated into portfolios. And if you sort of visualize, you start to visualize our portfolio collection of projects as a highway, you're gonna see a situation like this. Now, of course, this is not, this is pre-COVID, right? COVID-19, all the roads are empty now, but if you can imagine, think back to six weeks to whatever any major highway in, in any major city, in any part of any country in the world, that highway, you know, their highways kind of must have, we, we can remember that they look like this, right? So I want to ask you guys a question. When you look at this highway, what is the level of utilization of that highway? We've got a bunch of cars there. What's the level of utilization of that resource? 
hundred percent. Yeah, close to hundred percent. I mean, they've had a couple of cyclists or something like that. So a big mindset shift when we start to apply agile methods at scale is the focus on the throughput and not just utilization. Right? So if you just focus solely on utilization, we end up with a clogged highway or a clogged portfolio like the one you see here. So instead what we do is like, we say, yeah, you know, we need to keep our teams busy and engaged and working on this stuff, but we don't push them beyond that 80%. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you're gonna see that threshold at which the cycle time, the time it takes for something to, to get done rises exponentially. That's that 80% threshold. So we keep our working process below that 80% limit. So all our agile methods, Scrum does this sort of backs into it by saying, you can only do two weeks worth of work and that's it, all right? So we sort of limit the amount of work that we can do with our work in, in the sprint. Other Kanban would say, you have to have an explicit witness limit. So all our, you know, all our, whether it's at the, um, excuse me, as, whether it's at the um, project level, at the team level or the portfolio level, all of our agile methods are looking at limiting width. So how do we apply this at the VMO level? So I'm gonna show you another video over here. And this one is gonna talk about applying lessons from AI, uh, artificial intelligence, to, uh, to process planning. And how, um, and how, and traffic, and how we apply them to um, traffic flow. So let me put one of these guys down. It only takes Okay, I need a quick thumbs up again. I'm always nervous, always a little nervous when I move shift screen. Can you see the video? You can. All right. Again, uh, watch the volume because sometimes that's too loud. It just default jacks up the volume too loud. Okay. I think this is going to be good. It only takes a tap on the brakes to start a traffic jam. The next person breaks and soon you have a shock wave of stop and go. Similarly, anyone can prevent them. Just travel at a steady speed, a safe distance from the car ahead of you, and avoid braking unless necessary. You'll become a shock absorber in the system, but most people don't do this. Artificial intelligence may be a solution. Researchers have shown that AI can learn to manage traffic by controlling just a few autonomous vehicles. They tested their system on figure eights. When the scientists replaced just one of the 14 human-driven cars with an AV controlled by one of their algorithms, average car speed doubled. On ramps, replacing 10% of the cars doubled the number of cars passing through. For bottlenecks, replacing 10% of the cars increased throughput by more than 20%. In city grids, where the AI controlled lights, not cars, giving an algorithm control improved flow by 7%. Until we have self-driving cars controlling traffic for us, drivers can learn this from AI. Keep your distance and brake less. That's smart driving. All right. Keep your distance and brake less. Uh, some great advice over here. figure out how to keep our distance and break less. It only takes a... All right. Um, so basically what we're saying is that we got to figure out how to keep distance and break less. And, you know, um, we talked about teams that stay together, standing teams. So that's basically the idea that we dedicate core people, uh, core people on an end-to-end -end team. We make sure we get the resources, just like you've seen in the, uh, all the videos that we have shown so far. We need to make sure that we give the teams the resources they need. And this is, of course, the job of the Agile VMO. Make sure that they're getting their uh, MVP, right? We're focusing on throughput, maintain some slack, but not just try to do too much on the, around utilization. 
And then what we start to see is that we can deliver return on investment incrementally. And then and for the financial folks over here, you, you guys will know of this concept called the time value of money. So because we get value to market early, the aggregate value it turns out to be more, and that's around the economic principle of time value money, right? So having talked for a while, uh, I want to get you to through these next couple of slides and get you to a breakout room, and I'm probably going to have to ask for Volko's help over here. But this is our goal. Our goal as an Agile Value Management Office, whether we are a team member who's on the Agile VMO, or an executive on the, who's on the Agile VMO, or a middle manager who's on the Agile VMO, what we want to have is rapid, continuous delivery, and then we have this concept of release when ready. Right? It's, we, we can do dark releases, we can get stuff to production, and then we can just aggregate it and release it when it's ready. We want to map, match our work to outcomes, not outputs, and then the work has to happen on these dedicated end-to-end -end teams. So what you see, the, our image over there is these MVPs moving in smaller chunks, larger than bigger batch, batches. You have end-to-end -end teams, you have the portfolio of work and experiments sort of aggregated into the potential MVPs that are being queued up as a portfolio. And then a value stream uh, owner just prioritizing those and get and moving those through the channel, right? So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, I think, I'm, I'm, I wanna see. So we're gonna do 12 minutes discussion and then when you guys come back, there's a countdown timer for 30 seconds. Okay. All right. So everyone's back and do we have Lisa? Lisa, you're back. Do you want to just quickly lead us in a, a debrief? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so we're just going to kind of do a, a, a round robin. And so someone from every group will um, essentially talk through some of the things that you talked about. So we gave you a sort of a, a seed list or a starter list of things that um, as managers we could do or as um, as others, how we can leverage managers to sort of drive flow. Uh, so I am going to, would you like me to share my timer or would you guys like to I, just- I, I can share the timer, so. Oh, you're gonna, you have a timer to share? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, there we go. <laughs> there, there you go, okay. So who would like to, which, how many groups did we have? It looks, we must have, must five. have had like eight or five. so. Oh, we only had five. Oh, great, perfect. So who would like to go first? Otherwise, I'm just going to go down um, the list of participants and call on a group. <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll start. Uh, Is that Alfonso talking? Yes. Excellent, because you were the person I was going to call on. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Um, uh, what uh, we were discussing is um, why uh, groups tend to have a difficulty uh, clarifying what their value is that they're contributing uh, or individuals within the group uh, what is the value they're contributing um, and um, how, how they get past that identifying what it is and uh, um, being able to uh, generate ideas around that so that they can um, both define it and and uh, uh, improve on, on their output. And so in, in the way of using um, or uh, utilizing middle managers, is this a sort of a communication kind of a question or just a, 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 just a learning to speak the same language or learning to visualize work? Uh, visualizing work is, is, is identifying what it is that, that uh, the work is that they're, they're producing it or how they, uh, uh, as a team, uh, generate everything because they know what the end result is supposed to be, but how they get there is a big question. So there's a big problem uh, for them to be able to um, uh, communicate it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any comments on that one? Oh, time's up. Oh boy, that's bright red. <laughs> Okay, next group. Who would like to volunteer? Cesar, I can go next. Hey, Cesar. Uh, so in our group, uh, there were uh, different people in different 
uh, roles, different situations. So uh, somebody was a change agent at a new company. Um, somebody was dealing with managers and leaders um, or scrum master slash coach with a safe program consultant certification. And we talked about some uh, specific scenarios or things that uh, we're all facing or some of us are facing. And one of them was, um, what if the organization isn't there yet and you're not there to help them move forward? Um, they just don't even know that there's a forward to move to. Um, so some of the uh, suggestions were uh, looking for a sponsor, which is a little harder now that we're so remote. You can't go have lunch or get a coffee or just walk into a senior leader's uh, office and see, see what, what happens. Uh, so it's a little harder to do that. But otherwise, finding allies, uh, then possibly um, establishing measures and standards that uh, you're driving or that you're supporting some teams uh, for them to capture. And then with that, demonstrate and try to invite other teams and kind of propagate it that way. Uh, there was a recommendation about uh, small batch processing, uh, working with uh, very small teams on small things and then incrementally show uh, value and flow. Uh, lots of experimentation, iteration, um, and then bringing those results to management on a regular uh, basis. So then you achieve some of the uh, cadence communication, but it's to management and they may not have been requested, but if it has value, it'll be listened to. Um, and then there was a final suggestion, uh, if they're still not up for all of that, then say, nobody likes firefighting, doesn't have to hurt this much, why are we doing this? <laughs> I like that, so there's a, a common theme there with the previous one about uh, communicating, finding your, um, finding your advocates and understanding how the work flows for sure. Um, great, okay, who is gonna be next? I can go. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, I was in the group, Lisa, Lisa, and Nicole Jam, the two Lisas. <laughs> uh, so we talked about not doing everything at once. So kind of start smaller than you might initially think that you want to start. Uh, find your allies. Um, these people will make themselves apparent. They're the ones who will come to you um, after a talk or a presentation with follow-up questions and some, show some interest. And these are the people you're going to want to include as, as, um, as change agents. Uh, also, we talked about this concept of building trust and it, making it important that there are no surprises. So be upfront with any kind of challenges that you might encounter uh, with management, with the people, you're, with your allies, whoever you're working with. And then also language uh, is an important factor. Uh, when you're convincing people, um, discussing these topics, use their terms, use their language, so that they can really embrace what you're, what you're talking about, make it in their terms. That's all I have. All right, so some recurring themes about communication, starting small, finding your allies, utilizing them, speaking to them in their own language, understanding how things are flowing, making all of that visible, building that trust. These are kind of recurring themes. It's great, thank you. Um, who would like to go next? I can go next. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, in our group, we talked about uh, mapping the value stream and optimizing it. And we also talked about uh, the process by which projects get green-lighted and making sure that uh, all the different uh, groups that are need to contribute are, are aligned and what can happen when that doesn't happen. So providing data that has not happened in the past and maybe caused problems because teams were not aligned. So uh, optimizing the whole, those were the two main topics we discussed. So in addition to everything else, making sure that all the right people are in the room <laughs> up front. <laughs> and committed, committed to delivery, yeah. And committed. Excellent, thank you. With time to spare. All right, uh, next group. You should have at least one more. Was that it? Was that all the groups? I thought there was one more. I did too. Oh, um, I guess that's our group. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> we actually, um, 
talked about some books. So I, uh, I, I just, <laughs> I just went to Amazon and put a couple books uh, into my, uh, into my shopping cart. Um, Love it, man after my heart. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly certain why, but uh, we, we started with this conversation about. Um, uh, just culture, and um, and Ron had mentioned uh, a book uh, by M. Campbell, Tribal Unity, uh, Getting from Team to Tribes by Creating a One-Team Culture, and yep. um, his description of the book just really, um, it, it kind of took us off on a, our own little tangent, but it, uh, it was very fascinating, so I learned a lot of, uh, about that from Ron, and then um, the the, uh, the communication factor that someone um, uh, others have brought up uh, also uh, was something that Ron mentioned because uh, we were talking about his experience as an executive and, um, and the importance of um, using the words that the organi organization espouses, even if the organization itself doesn't live up to those words, but using those words and in, in, um, in leveraging those. And then um, he mentioned another, uh, we were, for some reason, again, on a tangent, I was asking about um, about if he's ever brought in employees that, you know, on the outside, espouse agile values, but then when they got there, uh, uh, there, there were issues. And yet another book, Handling the Difficult Employee by Marty Brownstein, uh, or Bronstein, I think. Um, and you just discussed the process uh, detailed in the book. So um, I learned a lot, even though we weren't necessarily on the right target. <laughs> and you're beautifully on time, too. I don't think you could have timed that better. <laughs> it's excellent. So a couple of book recommendations as well coming out of that one. Um, it's great. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Sanjeev. All right. Fantastic. So that was a fun discussion. Thanks a lot. Uh uh, one second, one second, Sajif. Walter, sure. I need to remind you to restart recording. Oh, that's, uh, I've already started. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, to we'll keep moving. We have this other uh, section over here on driving value. And um, I know uh, many of the folks in the audience are SPC, SAFE program consultants, who've heard of Scale Agile Framework. So there's always a concern uh, or a, a passion about is let's think, well, how do we make um, SAFE successful? And so one of the things that we've done is as we set up this concept of the Agile DNO, we said, well, many organizations are doing scaled Agile framework. You might be doing Scrum at scale or alternatively large scale Scrum, but at least here in the US, there are many organizations that are wrestling with, how do we make SAFE successful? And um, safe is a lot, you know, you have everything from a central safe to full safe and a you know, portfolio level safe in, in between. But uh, if, again, if you bring it back to the center and say, well, you've got this pantheon of stuff in safe that, that has, you know, you have value streams and then arts, uh, uh, and then arts below those and teams below that. How do we sort of sync it all and make sure that within our safe organizations, we're driving from the center and making the delivery value? So our answer to that has been to implement the structure and uh, we've actually talked with Luke Bowman and Dean Martin Merrill and others, and they've kind of like to do it well. But basically say, take the Agile VMO and use it to drive safe from the center. Okay? And so you see these three steps over here, the, uh, the setting the strategy, strategy, setting the strategy, measuring the results, and then really just executing and making it happen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how this is being done in organizations where we have been implementing SAFE uh, and using the Agile DMO to drive those SAFE implementations and make sure that they're successful. Because sometimes what, what can happen is you know, if, if the, uh, any large transformation, whether you're doing it in SAFE or others, can sort of quickly sort of spin out of control. And so we always like to bring it back to focusing on MVPs, like minimum viable products, making sure that delivery of value, I heard somebody say they're doing small batch delivery, right? this is exactly what they're talking about. Right? So if you have that portfolio, so I'm gonna switch the metaphors over here. We saw the uh, traffic metaphor, right? We, our portfolio is full of, uh, or the highway was full of traffic and he said the portfolio is full of stuff. Well, how do you clear up that portfolio and make even it out so that our value can flow? This is where our agile VMO can start to say, let's get rid of those, some of those large zombie product projects, right? these large projects that go on, nobody knows why we're still doing those. So um, let's get with our executives and just terminate, it, get rid of it. 
that will make you know just getting one of some of these large projects moving in or, or move or terminated and moved off the highway or moved out of the portfolio will remarkably accel accelerate the delivery of other value in the portfolio and entities. Taking large projects, products, and working on and just breaking them down into small chunks. Funding based on outcome, right? So we're talking about strategy, but well, part of the strategy is we're using some sort of out objectives and key results, OKRs, to deliver our outcomes. Then let's make sure that we're actually funding based on outcomes and the work is aligned to, uh, to business outcomes that have been set by our executives through the Agile DMO and therefore percolating to all of our teams. Limiting the delivery um, timeframe and then you doing this iteratively and reprioritizing. So you see the classic funnel diagram here, right? So we have an executive act and team. They're coming, there's a lot of stuff coming into the portfolio. The executive decide what is go or no go into the, the, uh, the pipeline and then the agile VMO helps sort of usher that into actual delivery or not. And then you, you see uh, one of our enterprise clients has an example of their, this is the front end of that funnel before any execution. So they have a backlog, this is the portfolio backlog, and you see those things moving along, very big digital chart, of, they call it a VMS, a visual management system, and all of that portfolio is represented on a, on a wall. And the VMO is meeting uh, at that wall every, uh, every week, talking to executives, and every month they're looking at that portfolio, that portfolio of projects and either terminating projects, breaking them up, or just accelerating them to the end. Right? So that's a real life example of how that this can be accomplished. Uh, here's another example. This one's a safe portfolio, where you're going to see the you know the the state the stages of the safe fund funnel. This is a portfolio kanban. So safe would call this a portfolio kanban. And uh, this lady, she's a, a senior uh, product owner. She is doing what Lisa loves to call walking the wall. Can you tell us what walking the wall is, Lisa? Me, Lisa, or do I get to punt it? To the other Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of Lisa Manley. I don't know the other Lisa yet. So, oh, but maybe she she's quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah and this uh, this this may be a running joke about me and uh, and program alignment walls. But um, the idea here is that um, you know this is this also goes back to sort of getting off your tush and walking around the floor and going to see what's happening. This is very much a go and see opportunity where you are looking at uh, this funnel in a very physical way and you are walking along the wall. Uh, trying to understand what ideas are in the pipeline, what is currently being analyzed um, for a no-go, no-go decision, um, and, and, and what is going to be implemented and what may be on the verge of being done. So this is your opportunity to have, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it, it's an information radiator, and, it, and it's meant to be huge, and it's meant to be in your face, and you're meant to go walk up to it and, uh, and get up close and personal with it. And you may have multiple programs that have walls, and so for an executive or a manager who may have some oversight or some um, insight into the various programs, getting up and walking around and just visualizing this work is, is, um, is critically important. Yeah, thank you. And then of course, you know, there's the whiskey or, or weighted shortage job way of prioritization and all that. So I don't want, necessarily want to make this talk about any specific method or the other, but the idea is that once we can visualize our work, then we can take out the non-value added work. We can, we can align the work with business outcomes or OKRs, objectives and key results. And then we can make sure that we're actually delivering value and removing the non-value added stuff from the portfolio, right? Um, big room planning, or as Safe calls it, PI planning. Who's um, who's heard of uh, who's done um, program increment planning or big room planning uh, over here? If you could yell out, I can't really see the the grid over here. Um, all right, fantastic. Lisa for for sure has done it. Anybody else who's done uh, big room planning or PI planning? I heard a lot of folks. Yep. So Sue and Samantha and all that. So uh, once again, you know, I, I like to, um, I love pictures and I even more than pictures, I love videos. So I'm gonna show you a video over here uh, where um, this is a picture, this is a short video of uh, a, um, a big room planning uh, uh, clip with one of our clients. And it's a short clip, so it's gonna move through quickly. So I'm just gonna let it roll and then I will um, explain it uh, shortly. Thereafter.
Okay. So um, I want to get you know get ask you guys to think about that uh, that silo chart that I showed earlier. The silo now sitting in a room, right? So this is two portfolios. I forget how many people this is like something something like four hundred people, multiple projects, and then two entire portfolios. This is a customer service and billing and um, product development organizations working together, complete two complete value streams, all getting together and all aligning across the entire organization. Right? So very, uh, very interesting uh, concept over here. And when, when it's applied um, to how we do work and our Agile BMO can help set up the, that session, the big room planning session or the PI, the program implemented planning session. In this case, they, they did the, uh, the program implement planning session. And they ended up with um, complete alignment. Now the organizational structure was still there, the silos still existed, but what we had, what we started to get was alignment and flow and value delivered across multiple portfolio with about you know, 400, 500 people uh, in two major sections, customer facing sections of this organization. Right? So, um, what I want to do is we're going to jump you into another discussion and then we'll close out with that. We're, I think, right bang on time. So Lisa, can you tell, uh, talk to this, uh, this slide and give us some ideas and then we'll have a, another uh, breakout room session where we'll have get your ideas about driving value. So the first breakout room session was around driving flow and we want to talk about driving value. So we're coming up on our uh, second breakout room session and we'll close out after that. But uh, Lisa, if you want to just kind of walk us through some of these things over here that you came up. Yeah, so I think if you um, if you scan quickly over this list of things, you'll see a uh, sort of a common theme around alignment and what are people getting aligned on, and it's a vision. So um, as a manager and as an, or as an executive, um, you know you need to communicate these things about ten times more at least than you think you do to make sure that everybody's moving in the same direction so that at least all the vectors are roughly pointing in the same direction. Um, and you can't do that if you don't have alignment. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's just the typical agile concept of um, focusing on the outcomes and not the outputs. So we're not, you know, it's not a question of how many stories go out there, but it's a question of what kind of value is the customer receiving? What are we, are we moving the needle on our, um, our um, objectives and key results like we anticipated? And then as a change age, agent, again, we're going back to, you know, find your advocates and utilize them. Um, these people are gonna be nodes in the network. We talked a little bit about networks before. Well, most middle managers are nodes in those networks, which means they have tendrils out into all kinds of uh, parts of the organization that you can leverage to help you remove roadblocks or, or address challenges or, or just give, yourself, give your teams a little bit of um, extra oomph. And then um, finally, making sure um, that um, every, but that information is flowing both ways. A lot of times information flows up and it doesn't come back down. And a lot of times information comes down and there's no information that bubbles up. So making sure that information is flowing both ways. And it, one of the ways to do that is to ensure that all work that's being done is very explicitly tied to strategy. And um, that is something that um, we, we, we run into a lot where you can't even answer the question of why we're doing this work. So those are just some, some ways in which as managers, you can help drive uh, value. And as change agents, you can leverage managers to, um, to help drive value as well. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. And so we're ready for our next breakout session. And this is where we get your ideas about how to drive value from the center. I did take the, um, did take the uh, screenshot, so you should have that in your chat window over there. Do you want to pull up, pull that up as a, as a reference? And so here we go around uh, again with our breakout rooms. And um, we will um, see you in a minute. I'll Welcome back, everybody. All right, so Lisa, we're gonna hand back over to you. So uh, welcome back. And we're gonna have a quick debrief, um, same cycle, minute and a half. So Lisa, all over to you. Great, perfect. So who would like to go first? It's it's the exact same format as before. You got a minute and a half just to talk through some of the, um, the suggestions or topics that came up. Uh, book recommendations, always welcome. So who would like to go first? Oh, yo, Rob's going to do it. Okay, great. great. Um, yeah, well, he, I'm in his group, so it's the same thing, too. It makes it like 
Uh, so how to drive value from the center. Um, uh, the last thing we just talked about was uh, communicate what customers want and show value. Um, we also thought that championing managers of advocates would work. Um, our biggest topic came down was related to bring voices from the trenches, what I call the trenches, to upper management. Um, try to actually have them in person. And there's two ways. So not only um, trying to get people from the lower levels up with the executive, um, but I actually find a way to get the executive to show up um, with the line, what I call line workers, um, if possible, too. Um, um, and if not in person, uh, how about a recording? So some way to get a communication using a recording. That led us to a side discussion that took up a lot of time was how to get the executive's attention. <laughs> it's one thing to try to get this ideal, but how to get their attention. Uh, uh, talk their language, get their attention, uh, work through sponsorship, even chain of reporting relationships, um, uh, through demos, invite them to demos. I can get their attention. Um, uh, if you prove value, that can get their attention. And finally, bringing transparency to them. For example, putting a stand up right in their path so they can't miss it and actually experiencing um, uh, the transparency in person and getting their attention that way. Excellent, thank you. I, uh, a few years ago, I worked at a company where they had an executive lunch every month. Now, of course, this, um, uh, it was a suggestion that the executive team kind of glom glommed onto. They were awesome. And so every month, they would sort of just rotate through. It was, a, it was like five, five folks. And they would have a dozen people. And they would cater lunch. It was always a nice lunch. And they would sit in a conference room. And a dozen you know, line, people on the line would get to just sit and chat off the record, on the record, whatever, with an executive. Um, once a month, and so they they uh, enforce this habit of having FaceTime um, both ways. Yeah, nice. All right, who's next? Um, I'll go. Yay. So uh, we talked about, the very first bullet talks about over-communicating vision by 10x, and we uh, posited that uh, 10x was what it used to be. When we, once we all went remote, it now needs to be in the, another order of magnitude. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I've run into that uh, over and over and over again in online conversations with folks who are, who are working on organizational change that, that the, the vision communication needs to be ramped up by another order of magnitude uh, in order to be successful. The second observation was that uh, it, the, that, that, that slide embodies core agile fundamentals of focusing on customers and focusing on outcomes. And we talked about creating cultures um, that value customer delight. And we talked about hiring for customer empathy uh, and the, uh, the necessity to create that, that the, the, the culture. So we went, we went back to culture creation um, and, uh, and, and uh, trust from the previous slide that is fundamental to creating the kinds of cultures that value, that, 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 um, that we can build agile values around. Excellent, thank you. Um, who would like to go next? I'll go. Okay, take it away, Eric. All right, so in our group, uh, we too resonated strongly with the need to over communicate the strategy. Um, the, the fact that it's uh, very easy to lose sight of that in uh, whatever firefighting or emergency of the day might be going on. Uh, and with that in mind, checking alignment of all work and projects against that strategy and always asking, you know, why are we doing this? Uh, it's easy, uh, some, that's not always specified. People just say what they want. And so really asking, why are we doing this? Writing this down so that uh, people are educated about that uh, is important. We also talked about uh, prototyping. So, and doing incremental investment and we talked about the need, uh, having a way to measure the outcome. So what metrics are we using to measure value and measure outcome? Excellent. And lastly, we talked about uh, 
the importance of coaching a mindset of continual improvement and Kaizen and root cause analysis to really uh, get everyone to think about value and how to improve value. Great, thank you very much. Time's up. <laughs> Again, so red. <laughs> um, who would like to go next? I can go. Great, thank you. Unless uh, Lisa E, you want to do it, either way is fine. Let's go for it. All right. <laughs> uh, we talked about um, cases where uh, giving the vision and promulgating it and repeating it and explaining to uh, the, the people doing the work why they're doing the work pays off. And those people really look forward to understanding why they're doing things that really motivates them. But we also talked about cases where that doesn't happen. So in some cultures, some work cultures um, in an organization, it can be the case that it's very maybe top down and people are just clocking in and out and they don't want, they don't need, they feel they don't need that vision because they're, they're going to be told what to do anyway. So there has to be a cultural shift here and the, um, you know, agile coaching can can maybe uh, identify this and overcome this. Uh, we also talked about keeping the vision simple. Like if you throw everything in the kitchen sink in there, some, so you dilute the message and it doesn't come across very well. And as well, we talked about uh, what you called uh, walking the talk. In other words, really mean what you say in the vision. It can't just be a poster on the wall. It has to be something that's actually being acted upon and you see it. Um, kind of led by example, uh, so it'll resonate with people. Excellent, thank you. Um, All right, <clears throat> I can I can go next. Thank you, Volker. We started our conversation reflecting on you know the challenge of in your example, 400 people, aligning 400 people in a large group meeting. And um, we heard about an example in the animation studio cultures um, where the contribution of everybody is so invited and needed and, you know, uh, there's really no expertise about which gag makes it or which good idea shapes uh, the, the storylines. And uh, then we dug into the difference, how difficult it can be to identify the difference between outcome and output. And that there's an important relationship about how close to my contribution and why I show up at work, how closely related is that to the outcome? So there must be sort of several layers of outcome definitions that we can measure and that my efforts actually make a difference. If it's too high level, then the motiv my motivation to contribute goes down because it just becomes too, too minimal. And we used uh, the animation example as well here to identify how much avoiding work and avoiding dead ends and the prototyping uh, plays a role in that. Terrific, thank you. So what was the animation studio that you, uh, that you guys were talking through? So, Pixar came up. Pixar, okay, <laughs> cool. Um, all right, I think we have uh, one or two more left. That couldn't have been everybody. Was it everybody? No. Who hasn't gone? Okay. <laughs> that sounds like Sanjeev. I think I think sounds like that was probably everybody. <laughs> it was everybody. Okay. Fantastic. Well, um, in that case, um, let's see if there are I'm not sure what the protocol is. Um, so let me and, Happy to just uh, open it for Q and A, and then yeah, uh, open conversation. For Q and A, and I'll hand back to you as I'm doing that. Do we want to uh, do the final uh, Mentimeter now, or do we want to do that at the end? End. 
I think we're we're good. I don't know. Ask. Let's ask our folks. Do you want? You guys want to do another quiz? Q and A. I think folks want to. Oh, what is it? <laughs> yeah, they this way. Before I agree. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're just, yeah. you have to dive into this one. So just like we did the word cloud before about, you know, sort of where you are in your organization. Um, this one is just about what, what thing are you, did you take away? What small thing are you going to implement um, starting tomorrow at work? Um, and so that was just the, that was the next Mentimeter just to, to word cloud your ideas about what you walked away with that you're going to be able to do tomorrow, a small change that you can make within your control um, to move in this direction. Thumbs up if you're for it. Okay. Can we do so it? Lisa, you're the co-host, so you can show the uh, um, you can show the uh, your screen and have folks do our final quiz, and we'll we'll be done. Let me uh, pop the uh, link in there again. It's, so the link is in the chat again, and I will share my screen so you can watch it happen. There we go. <laughs> Hundred X. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> This is cool. I can package these as a PDF and send it off to you too um, for, for distribution if you guys like. Lots of communication, ask them demos, metrics, measure flow. Few more coming in. I was thinking demo more, but someone else beat me to it. Well, if you put that in, then it'll, it'll show up even uh, bigger and darker. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have the right to add more? Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Speak early, speak often. There we go. There so, you go. See? <laughs> <laughs> You just you just bumped it to the top. <laughs> okay, that's twenty entries. Um, so I uh, um, oh twenty one. They're very eager people. <laughs> I know it was awesome. Um, I'll just grab a quick screenshot of this. So thank you very much, and then um, I will um, turn that over back now to. Um, Whoever's going to take control, Sanjeev or? Volker's in control. I think we're going to question and answers just for maybe five minutes and sure. then we'll wrap it up. Comments, questions, highlights. I want to thank everybody, um, especially Sanjeev and Lisa and Volker. Thank you. and. Thank you to the various team members that I got to work with, but I have to leave. Oh, Cheers. Thanks, Samantha. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the VMO itself. What are who are the typical people who are in the VMO, or is it the concept of this uh, team, the way you described how the teams are arrived at? Yeah. Or is there a core set of people who are in the VMO? So there is a core set, and those are the middle managers. So typically, these are director level. Sometimes you get a VPSO. So you know, usually senior managers are directors, sometimes senior directors. So that's the core set. Um, you, you'll have executives, business and IT. So you know, a current client that we're at in your area, actually, the CIO is a part of it, and she shows up occasionally. But usually, it's that level of middle managers. 
and then we have team level folks as there as the, uh, there as well. So you know, program managers, uh, project managers, team fo team level folks coming in sometimes. So, but that core set is the middle managers management layer that we've been talking about. And the the VMO is like a scrum of scrums in the sense that it's it's a it's a gathering or a meeting or a, a group of people that that uh, meet on a regular basis as opposed to something structural or hierarchical. Well, um, yes and yes. So the scrum of scrums is the mechanics of the meeting, right? So that's the they they it's it's a scrum of scrums type meeting that they have at least once a week. But it's more than that. They they have all the work streams that they're tracking. They're looking at the portfolio. There's a there's an organizational structure to it. It's like who's going to be in these meetings. So it's not just scrum of scrums. Usually it's one or two people from each team. But here we're saying management is there, executives are there as well. And then they're they're tracking all the work that's in the portfolio on the execution side, and they're also tracking all the work that's coming into the portfolio in terms of the, the queue of work that's being done. So they're like, okay, here's the work that's coming in, all the demand. They're gonna uh, they're gonna flow the demand, prioritize it, and flow it, and then they're gonna track the execution of that demand across multiple teams, multiple programs, and multiple portfolios. Is there an owner of the VMO? Um, Typically, the executive is a sponsor, right? So usually, you know, C-level person, or at least a senior senior VP, to bring that executive cloud. And they don't necessarily show up that often, but they're usually delegating to a, like a, um, you know, the the spawn, basically the uh, the person who owns the transformation. So sometimes, with, if it's in within Safe, it's the head of the Lean Agile Center of Excellence or the Lace. Um, that's the you know the the operational owner, but you also have an executive owner. Yeah, and size of the VMO, the number of people? Just depends. How much, what's our current one, Lisa? Uh, how many I think we have people? about a dozen, if, but probably 10 people show up. Um, Regularly. There's like 25 people invited, but there's a core group of 12, 10 to 12 that shows up. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sanjeev, um, I have a question. Did you ever look into, I mean, have you heard, did you ever look into Hayer Group from China? Yes, I love Hair Group from China. They're awesome. In fact, uh, one of the privileges that I had was to uh, go to the Drucker Forum in mm -hmm. Vienna. And I heard Jean Ruimin, uh, the CEO, I, I, I saw him live and I shook his hand and didn't understand anything more than that. But they have a, uh, he gives this talk, <laughs> he gives this talk in Mandarin and they have a live translation. So it was one of the most electrifying moments uh, in the, of any conference that I've gone because this guy shows up. He's got this coterie of all, all these photographers and all that, and they're all taking pictures and the video thing. He's like a celebrity, and not like he is a celebrity, but he gets up on the stage and he starts talking and you've heard people drawn on, it's like typical management conference. But when he talked, the, what he talked about was so compelling that you know, it's it's the same. It's a similar idea, the whole kind of, you know. Yeah, you, it, is, it is the similar idea. Yeah, and yeah very that's much why so. I ask. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, you, you hit the nail on the head, right? So it's that idea for him. He's, he's saying this, the VMO becomes the ascent or a VMO-like structure becomes a ascent uh, entrepre entrepreneurial group. And they've just reconfigured the entire company into, I forget, do you remember the number of uh, 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 autonomous teams that they have? It's like, you know. No, I, I, I don't remember the number of autonomous teams, but what struck me when I was reading about them in uh, uh, Harvard Business Review, the article was, I think, somewhere at the end of the last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's like how they really organized in agile ways where the uh, product teams are really allowed to listen to what a customer wants and do whatever their own modifications yeah. for the regions. And uh, whole enterprise systems such as uh, IT, HR, and whatever, they are working as a contractors to the product right. team. Yep. And if, um, if the product team put a bid for the services from HR that HR couldn't meet, they're yeah. able to go and... To somebody else. Yeah, and have it like, uh, you know, find it somewhere else. It was un unbelievable. And so I was just wondering if you look into, if you f found... Uh, any graphics on how they're like um, organizational? What you what what did you call it? The network t t team teams network whatever. A, net, a network of teams, yeah. Or team yeah, I, I I wonder how they organized that way. Can you put this organization's name and its people into the chat? 
Uh, sure. Yes. For all of us. It's a hair group. Um, and I never I'll, would have been able to spell that. Paste. Oh, uh, sorry. And I'll um, no. I'll do the uh, copy link. So what, what I was curious about, and I'm sorry to take so much time, but it's really fascinating. Um, the, the way they organize for business sounds really agile. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. And I heard them, I heard Drucker uh, Forum in live streaming. So oh, I, fantastic, yeah. Yeah, so I, um, I listened to his presentation. But what else is bothering me is like with China, there is always... You know, they're like communist country. There is like, yep. there could be unknown. Like, can can we have a communist agile? <laughs> that is my question. <laughs> yeah. And recently, I also watched absolutely fascinating documentary um, on Netflix called American Factory. Ah. I recommend highly. Uh, it is about uh, all the... Um, uh, well, uh, Whatever, sorry, I forgot the name of the large corporation, American corporation that closed its plant in Ohio and it was purchased by um, Chinese to mm. produce something else and how they were trying for a couple of years to work with, you know, with bringing two culture, efficiency and management techniques together. And it's absolutely fascinating. But what struck me that there was a lot of a top down you're a little bold in this. Yep. You're kind of empowered, but you're still a little bold. And uh, versus the American culture and how we like all very individualistic and how we take it in our approach to work. And I was just wondering, like, would it be like fascinating to really look at this air system from the inside and how this all really functions? That's why I asked the question. Um, yeah, I, I think it's be uh, fascinating. Now, I do know that. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, Gary Hamill, the mm -hmm. management consultant, he's been involved with the higher con uh, 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 transformation uh, as well. So, um, so we do get some a little more insight into it. So, uh, it's not quite as uh, you know opaque as other Chinese companies are. Plus, uh, the the owner Zhang Ruimin is you know, China. China is a communist country, of course, but they. They also have a you know a very sort of capitalist mindset, right? They, they're right. probably more billionaires in China than than anywhere in the world, and I think Zhang Ruimin is one of them. So um, I guess my point is they they have a, an authoritarian communist uh, country, but they run some amazingly entrepreneurial capitalist type company, companies within that within that country. So yeah. Yeah. I was trying to pull up a slide because I have a certified Agile leadership class and mm -hmm. uh, as part of our Agile Leadership Academy and I was trying to pull, pull up the slide over here for where we actually have this um, higher cooperation um, uh, case study and we discuss it and we talk about how to set up the teams because they have this what, what they call a win-win-win model. Mm -hmm. You have customers, everything is done with the alignment of customers. So you have customers and the income statements are set up that you got, you, you only get paid if you sell products to customers. And that applies to not just the product teams, but also, you know, as you mentioned, HR or uh, accounting or IT, you know, you yeah. have, it's gotta be a win, win, win across the entire value stream driven by the customers. And you literally only make money, you get paid to sell products. And if you don't wanna pay your IT department or you don't wanna pay, uh, HR or the legal guys, well, or you go, you just go out and find the cheapest bid. So it's just an, it's an incredible system. It's sort of mind blowing for us to think about. Yeah, absolutely. How true it is, I don't know, but at least they, they talk a good talk. Yeah, well, the, the link that I pasted, uh, it lands on the graphic that is very similar to your model. So like we all can yeah. look at that later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So sorry, Walker, we went more than five minutes over there. I'm German. I have a very loose sense of time. <laughs> so I don't believe your head is probably that. It's totally right. I told you I'm I'm German too, so I'm looking at uh, 
Eleven fifty-six. We've got four minutes left, according to your clock. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, guys, for um, thank you so much. taking your time and being from the East Coast. And uh, Lisa, you're in Nashville or whatever you are. Exactly. It's, it's midnight. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, Definitely past my bedtime, but this was so enjoyable. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just been an absolutely wonderful evening. Uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to spend it with you for sure. Thank you for having us. Enjoy. Stay safe, and then. Hopefully we'll meet in person in one of these uh, in 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 uh, yeah. less troubling times. Don't touch it. Look, <laughs> look forward to hosting you guys in May. In May, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, like everyone who comes to our May meeting. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Great.